Thank you all for being here on a Thursday night. I am very impressed to see um, all of you here. Thank you so much for having me. Can you hear me in the back? Do I need to speak louder? Okay, all right, sounds good. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say thank you uh, to all of you for being here, uh, but also to the Center for European Studies, the Center for the uh, Humanities and the Public Sphere, and to the College of Education for allowing me to come uh, and share my research with you. Uh, but I also want to make sure that I thank my gracious hosts uh, from the College of Education, Professor Nancy Dana and James Rigney, who have just made me feel very welcome uh, here uh, uh, at the UF. So thank you. So the title of my talk today uh, is Speaking Behind the Curtain, um, Political Theater of Russian Education Reforms. Um, as, and as it has already been mentioned, uh, sorry, I will figure this out. All right, a little more advanced technology that I'm used to. Um, the talk is based on a book that is coming out in October. And the basic premise of that book um, is uh, looking at educational policy making through the lens of theater. Um, and using theater to both gain deeper insights into what might be happening, but also to think about the possibilities of breaking the hold of neoliberal imaginary um, that we have all been under. So just very briefly, um, this uh, book is based uh, or is rooted in anthropology of policy and it's based on critical multi-sided ethnography. Um, I conducted this research over a number of years um, and in developing my theory, I was working with performance studies, uh, theater, theory, um, as well as work in political science, like for example, political spectacle that some of you might be familiar with. So all of this uh, kind of brought me to this place of thinking about political theater in policy making, on the one hand, um, as something that we can best understand through the techniques and strategies used in theater. So my book takes apart educational reforms that happened in Russia between 2011 and 2017 while I was doing my research, following these little strategies, right? So how can we understand what's happening by unpeeling some of the masks in the policy? Or what can we learn about this policy by thinking about scripts? that are used on how they're designed. So today, what I'm gonna dive into a little bit deeper is actually this notion of production sequence that is used in theater. And the idea there is that actually all the steps leading up to the production are fairly um, strictly structured. And the points at which you enter that production sequence determine your role in that production. So the person responsible for lights enters at one particular stage, right? Actors enter another stage, so on. So how can we think about the policy production uh, process through the lens of theater? Well, I took apart the policy that I was working with and I came to this conclusion that it helps us see ways in which policymakers work to create an illusion of participatory policy making. So how did I get that? Well, when I was in the middle of my fieldwork, the Ministry of Education of the Russian Federation posted on their website a letter that was allegedly, allegedly, written by the assistant minister to the Minister of Education, reporting to him on the work that has been done to develop a teacher education reform. And in that letter, it stated that there was a working group that worked to develop this policy, this reform, and that this working group had multiple public discussions of the ideas that they had. They solicited more ideas from 3,000 people who participated in different events around that policy. And now the final version of the concept that defined where the reform was headed was developed and posted on the website of the Ministry of Education. So this letter suggests a few things. First, it suggests that there is a timeline that says the work started February 2013. The ministry 
organized an official working group. That working group held some meetings around conferences. And then in January, the Ministry of Education posted the reform proposal on their website. This communicates a very participatory and involved process, right? So many people were involved in creating this policy. Except there are tiny cracks in that story. And I picked up on those cracks by talking to the reformers, who actually said, well, we went to those events. We told them what we want to do. If they had anything worthwhile to say, we would consider it. But my analysis actually showed that the changes did not happen. And even if folks had something to say, the critiques of the policy were excluded from the final text. <clears throat> OK, so it seems like all of these folks, 3,000 people, are attending those events, but their role is not quite the conceptualization of this reform, right? OK, well, so what helps us here? The unofficial timeline. So in an interview with the working group secretary, secretary um, I actually learned that there was a small group of people who started meeting in October 2012. Right, so what, four or five months before the official group was created? And that group was busy thinking through what needs to be done, how to organize the work, how to design the reform, and so on. Who is she talking about? Oh, I hope I hit the red button. No, I'm not hitting the red button. So there's a small group right here, and they're designing this concept. Technically, their names are on the list of the official working group, but the official working group is 25 people. They did not start working until February 2013. These guys are meeting together since October 2012. What's interesting about them is, first of all, they are academics. They call themselves education reformers, but they're actually not in any official policymaking capacity. So that's one thing. Most of them actually work for the economics university. So they're designing education reforms when really their background is in a completely different discipline. What else is interesting about them is that, first of all, many of them are connected with international organizations. So there's World Bank. Um, there's McKinsey connections, there's OECD connections, and not only are they connected to international organizations, they're also connected to educational policy entrepreneurs. So people like Michael Barber, um, he was in Tony Blair's uh, cabinet, then he moved to McKinsey, published very influential reports. And what I call this is a role reshuffling. Right? I've been embedded in that community long enough to know that the reformers themselves, right, the small group of academics that I showed to you, are the ones who are pushing for this change. But they have backdoor access to folks who can push it upward. And so then President Putin gets pulled out to really just legitimate what they are already doing backdoor, backstage. Um, the issue here, however, is that most people assume that it is, in fact, the president who is calling for this change. Most people assume that it is the ministry that is creating the working group to put together these proposals. Most people assume that it is the ministry who issued the letter that described how this policy was designed. <coughs> and again, being in their community, the letter that I started out with, reformers wrote that themselves. The working group, they put it themselves. The reform directions, they chose themselves. So they use role reshuffling to put an institute of power or a representative of the institute of power as the central figure that is directing reform efforts, when in reality, this central figure couldn't care less about anything that's happening in education. I mean, Putin has talked a little bit about how it's important to have PE and important to teach students to have healthy lifestyles, but really teacher education was not his thing. It is reformers themselves who pull out this person and say, that's who wants it and that's why we have to do it. Or the ministry tells us to do this, that's why we're doing this. What's the problem with this? The problem with this is that no one is accountable for anything that happens, right? Because the figurehead can't care less 
And whoever is operating in the shadows is not visible to the audience to be called out for questioning. Something very similar happened in the United States with education reforms as well. President Bush initiated very controversial reforms, No Child Left Behind. People were very upset about those reforms. And when Obama was running for president, there was this expectation that things will change. Except the president steps in, reforms go on the same way. And now we have more research that actually indicates that because reforms are pushed, by actors in the shadows. And in the United States, it's more philanthropists, conservative think tanks, nonprofits that are pushing for those reforms. The figureheads change. The actors who push for action remain the same. So something to think about. Well, going back to the Russian case, what were the reform goals? Well, the conversation around the world, and the United States is no exception, is about the quality of education. And quite often you will hear, Russia and here, that the colleges of education don't give us good teachers, they're failing, therefore we have to dramatically reform them to improve the quality of education. Well, in the Russian case, and it actually something very similar happened in the United States, uh, where we have common core standards that came out, then we had uh, a nonprofit that issued new standards for teachers in the U.S. as well. And then we had teacher education reform proposals, both in Russia and the U.S., actually about the same time too. But in Russia, when I looked very closely at how these policies, these reforms that were happening at about the same time were working, what I actually noticed that this conversation about quality education actually obscures something else that is happening. In theory, we talk about selective focus. You find a villain, you direct all the light on them, education, teacher education, bad teachers, right? But what is left out is a lot that is happening in the dark. So what's happening in the dark here? In Russia, general education standards, so the standards that are used for uh, K through 12, all of a sudden shifted away from knowledge to developing personality traits. Similarly, teachers' professional standards shifted away from knowledge, knowledge transmission, knowledge creation, and instead turned into behavior control, and again, shaping students' personalities. And this standard was actually supposed to be used for contracts that would determine teachers' pay. Right, so imagine paying teachers' performance-based <coughs> pay based on how they control their students' behavior. And then finally, teacher education modernization that I looked more closely at actually worked to deprofessionalize teachers. So instead of giving them higher education degrees, for example, the reformers wanted to give them basically community college education across the board, no matter where they were from. Okay, all right, so these are fairly big, dramatic transformations, right? Like it's a complete reorientation of absolutely everything that's happening in education. And think about it, this is all happening 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, right? So very short span of time, very recently. One quick note that I want to make is that another thing that was invisible to anyone who was following Russian uh, education reforms was the fact that most of the folks who were connected in this network um, that was putting together these different proposals, they all belonged to the network that was originally created by a Soviet philosopher by the name Georgi Petrovich Shidravitsky. Very few people in Russia know anything about him. Outside of Russia, I have not met a single person who knows anything about him. But he was a fascinating character. He used Vygotsky's theory of activity theory to actually move to the claim that thinking exists outside of people. So he would organize what he called organizational activity games, and he would get people to solve problems together but he would do it by controlling what roles different people played. So some of the people who had a chance to participate in those games actually talked about how they felt that they were a part of a human computer, where their own consciousness or individuality was canceled out, but all that mattered was their contribution in the work of the overall group. 
so through his games, he actually was able to predict that the Soviet Union would collapse. Not exactly the year, but he knew that the end was coming. But also through this network, he managed to actually reach out to a lot of powerful institutions across the country. Now back into education, his claim was that we need a new theory of pedagogy, of how we teach people, and what we need to focus on is how to train people for specific roles in the society. His point was that people are different, abilities are different, let's not waste resources on those who will never succeed. He actually wanted to make sure that there are the elites that get the best, and then everybody else just, is just trained for the position that they will occupy. And this activity theory in the Russian context and actually globally, in different versions of it, got picked up by the corporate sector. And in Russia, they still run an annual conference where corporate actors and people um, affiliated with Shadrovitsky's foundation uh, talk about the training that they offer, where they retool human beings for the roles that corporations require them to play. All right, so that's the kind of person that informed what was uh, happening in education, right? Not necessarily directly, he is dead, he died in 1994, but through the influences of his network that still runs many of these ideas. So what does that mean in terms of how this education reform was conceptualized? Well, there's two things that I want to highlight. And then the first one is that his son continues the teaching that only a minority can benefit from education. The rest need training. And the reformers would actually say things like, children from the drunk part of town don't need advanced math. They just need math to solve their problems. I am actually a person from a drunk part of town. My father is an alcoholic. The advanced math that I learned in school that was based on the Soviet model um, actually got me into American universities. So when I heard these discussions, my heart would break, honestly. This part of my book when I was writing, I was just bawling because it just broke my heart about what it means to have such a vision. But there's something else, and that is how reformers talked about the connection between <coughs> teachers, schools, education, and social unrest. Because the point that they keep, kept making was, we need to have teachers that will prevent any form from uprising. So if any of you know, um, in Kiev, 2014, there was a protest in the central square called Maidan. That was a protest that toppled the government at that time, right? The president had to leave Ukraine. And so these events, me conducting this research is happening around the same time, and reformers are saying, we don't need a Maidan here. So we're gonna have an education reform that will prevent people from going to the streets. Similarly, when they talked about the civil rights struggles in the United States, they talked about it as the issue of a lack of education. The argument was, if only those people received the right kind of education, they would not have been marching in the streets. Think about it. People who are fighting for justice are being accused of not having received the right kind of education. What is the future that is being constructed through these types of reforms. And these types of observations kind of pointed me to the fact that there is a turn towards conservative social change in Russia, but also in other contexts around the world. Russia is not unique in proposing these types of changes. There's something else that was a little bit harder to study, uh, but still played a role, again, back in the shadows that were not visible to all the others. And that was the conversation about the corporate involvement. It first came up with something who was outside of the reformers' networks, but was very closely connected to the work they're doing as an observer. And when I asked him about, well, well, how about citizens, right? Isn't education about producing citizens? His response was, do corporations need citizens, <laughs> right? And then he talks about how is there a state demand for ecological disaster? No, but we have it. So we understand perfectly well that state demand, right, what state determines 
is driven by corporations wishes what's interesting about it he says this really powerful thing and I pause and I say but what are the corporations that are involved and that's where the conversation ends and that's actually not the only time it happened it was a fairly consistent pattern where I would talk to people formally through interviews or informally and when we would get to any kind of conversation about corporate involvement the doors would shut <laughs> and the conversation would be over the only exception to this is, for example, someone who at an event for future teachers talked about how, well, actually the reform is happening because what's the, that's what businesses want. And he attacked me, thinking that I was a Russian teacher educator, for not doing what businesses and corporations wanted. Um, something along this, along similar lines, though not stated as directly, Russian Minister of Education in 2007 actually talked about how we don't need creators, we just need consumers. Right? So this ideology of who determines the direction has changed dramatically, and a lot of people are not fully aware of this change. In this conversation about businesses need workers, but you don't provide them, um, there were actually scientists in Russia who did the analysis of the human capital quality, and their conclusions were, Russians are very well educated. The problem is that they don't want to work for the miserly pay. So when the working conditions are bad, they rebel. <laughs> so back to the point of what is this reform about it is about producing more compliant subjects that are more willing to go along with whatever they're offering all right i talk about this from the perspective of the analysis but i also talk about it from the perspective of what we can do and this is a call to all of us not just educators but we need to be thinking about how we can be aware of what is happening how we can remember our histories and know that societies change and we can be active participants in creating that change and to create that change we have to work together and collaborate together so that is what i conclude my book with is this call to action however today i'll wrap up on a slightly different note um, and that is a bit of a reflection on just how fortunate i feel that i was even able to do this research because on the one hand as you know, Russia is politically charged, and having an, an, an affiliation with an American university posed a bit of a threat. And so in quite a few places where I was, I was reminded that the Federal Security Bureau might be somewhere around, right? Former KGB, <laughs> if you watch any <laughs> movies about the Soviet era, you would know those are fairly scary people to work with, uh, to deal with, not work with. <laughs> For example, I did most of my, a lot of my research in teacher education institutions and I had this casual encounter with this lovely young woman who talked to me about how she works at the university only one day a week. That's common. Many faculty are actually part-time. And then she works for the industry the rest of the week. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then somebody told me, well, actually industry means FSB. <laughs> And I thought, oh great, <laughs> let me think about what we discussed, right? For two weeks I couldn't sleep because it was just like, gosh, what did I say to her? <laughs> Will I get shipped out? And I also was doing this field work around the time when the conflict in Ukraine started, right? And I got, got very anxious whether I was actually safe. And folks would kind of look at me and be like, ah, don't be crazy. But after I came back to the US, I started learning about the stories of Western researchers who were actually pulled out of the archives and um, charged with violation of visa regulations and deported. <coughs> but they were also deported without the right to come back for at least five years, right? So for an academic <laughs> who invested a lot in a research project on Russia to all of a sudden have a stamp in their passport that says you are not allowed to come back, but also just the mere fact of dealing with Federal Security Bureau or immigration officials is traumatic enough to never go back to even thinking about this. In 2019, the Ministry of Education actually issued a new decree that says that Russian scholars are not allowed to meet with Westerners without a prior permission from the Ministry of Education. So they have to request a permission. 
they have to make sure that the meeting is attended by at least two or three people. At the end of the meeting, everybody has to have their passports scanned and photocopied, and they have to write summaries of what was discussed during that meeting. There is a major upheaval about this proposal right now. Um, there's some conversation whether it will actually go into effect or not. But as I look back at these major transformations, I realize just how fortunate I was that I even managed to conduct this research. So I'm very thankful to the many participants who talked to me. Um, I'm very thankful to many people who invited me into their institutions, knowing that this was <laughs> the direction that we were headed. So with that, I uh, want to say thank you uh, for listening to my story, uh, but also, um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer.